Welcome back, AP. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom. Our second flip of the fourth quarter, and we are ahead of schedule, which is absolutely fantastic and a great feeling and a great place to be, right? So let's keep staying ahead of schedule, and let's dive right back into what we were talking about in class, right? So with class today, we spent a lot of time talking about how we're going to do our sign-ups, right, for the LEQ overview, for your exam overview, which have started already, and my S period today is already booked, but please come up. Remember, the biggest thing about me actually, like, reweighting the grades and stuff like that is you got to do this for me just because if you don't, all right, I can't really give you those points back on your exam for that actually like kind of like coming in and reworking your writing and stuff like that right but let's use this as a win-win situation let's use this as a you get something out of it which you get better at your writing and you get points back and I get something out of it which you get better at your writing so the biggest thing about it though is is we left off talking about the political state of late 1800s Europe right we are encroaching upon a very intense war right we are getting very dangerously close to World War one which will begin in 1914 but the period that actually begins or starts or fuels World War one ranges from about 1871 up to about 1914 okay these 40 ish years are gonna be very very important and your understanding of the growth and like enlargement and like solidification of political systems and also the solidification of like not liking each other a little bit right but also threatening like larger countries Britain's gonna be threatened by Germany now because Germany's gonna have a booming economy and they're gonna really really grow very very quickly right but we left off talking about Germany in class right we started talking about Car or uh, Carl von Bismarck. <laughs> Otto von Bismarck. He's definitely not Carl, all right? That's Karl Marx. So the big thing about it, though, is, oh, 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 speaking of, if you don't already have one, okay, if you do not already have a copy of the Communist Manifesto, it's okay. I will have printed out copies available for, for, for you in class, right? Like PDF printed out copies for you, available for you in class as well. Okay, I'm going to actually send those to print today and stuff like that. If you don't, like, that's fine. But if you do, please bring your copy of the Communist Manifesto into class because we are going to be reading that going into the next, like, week over the weekend, stuff like that, okay? So the big thing about it, though, that we need to understand is that you need to bring that with you if you don't already have it, okay? Got it? Cool? Good. Because we are talking a lot about the growth of communism and its solidification as a political ideal during this, like, like next few flips and stuff like that. But anyway, let's pick up where we left off in class, right? Otto von Bismarck and his relations politically, socially, and economically within the boundaries of this new, brand new country known as Germany, right? So the thing about the German Empire, some couple of things that we need to understand 100% is that things are looking good for the German Empire, right? They're now unified as of 1871. They unified together like in the Hall of Mirrors and also write this down, their economy is booming, right? So the Germans are going to go through and begin to catch up to the British in forms of industrialization, okay? Germany is going to become home to really, really big things like chemical engineering, the production of steel, um, like medicine and chemical companies, like if any of y'all have ever heard of Bayer before, like Bayer Aspirin or Bayer, or like B-A-Y-E-R, the big pharmaceutical company, they actually are started in southern Germany, right? Bayer literally means Bavaria in Germany. And so it's basically alluding to the fact that Germans were very good at chemical engineering. Also, the Krupp family in Germany is making weapons by the boatload. <laughs> I get it because weapons were also boats at the time. So like the thing about it though is Germany is industrializing very quickly. But Bismarck still has an issue on his hands. And his biggest issue is how does he integrate all these Germans into this new concept called Germany? He's got to figure out a way to make it so people actually look to Germany and the flag and the German Empire flag and German Empire songs and all the new things that define the German Empire as their nation instead of just their region of Germany, right? Because Bavarians are still considering themselves Bavarians first and then German Empire residents second, right? Other members of the German Empire at this point, pieces of places like Stuttgart and like other areas in Western Germany, like towards Dusseldorf, are beginning to be like, are we really that German? Is this a together thing? How do we do this? So that's Bismarck's biggest problem, is he's got to figure out this concept called integration, right? How is he going to integrate all these brand new Germans into this society and make them feel as though they are more German, right? Well, there are two forms of integration. You have positive integration and you have negative integration, right? And we talked about these a little bit in class. Positive integration is making them feel good, making them feel pride in Germany, right? Doing things for them and always going forward, right? Negative integration is like kind of creating a common enemy amongst them so they will join together and fight against them, right? So negative integration would be like, Chappelle will be forever dominant when we go and fight Mount Carmel, right? Like I'm 
subjugating someone else to try and bring all of you together, okay? Positive integration, on the other hand, is more like, I'm going to bring y'all donuts every Friday for forever, right? That's positive integration because you're Chappelle Chipmunks and you're the best. Like, it's trying to make you feel good about this entire system. And I will tell you this, if Bismarck showed us anything, positive beats negative every time, okay? Because some of the earliest movements that actually Bismarck tried in the forms of negative integration were actually like his first trials, right? He actually went to the negative integration stance before he ever went to the positive one first, right? So for example, the first thing he did was this thing known as Kulturkampf. Now look, this is another German word that a lot of you are like, Mr. Terry, I don't speak German. But luckily for you, I do, so we're good. So Kulturkampf literally means culture struggle, all right? Kampf means struggle or like a fight or something like that, okay? So the thing about it though is, is Kulturkampf is basically saying the struggle of the culture, right? And what we mean by that is this, okay? This is what Bismarck did. He actually passed a series of laws and pushed them through the Reichstag, right? And never forget the Reichstag, that lower house of parliament and stuff like that that they have that's basically like their house of commons okay push some laws to the right shock and stuff like that that would limit the power and the growth of the catholic church in germany right so the thing that bismarck decides to do is he kind of basically tells himself you're like you know what most germans are whatchamacallit most germans are like uh they're lutheran they're protestant and stuff like that so why don't we create a system where the catholic church has like no power and basically no rights within this new country that we call the german empire we will collectively bring all the protestants together that will kind of go against the catholics the catholics will be limited in their ability of educational standards they won't be able to open as many schools and also bismarck wanted to kind of control the appointment of bishops and stuff like that man we're going like all the way back to investiture right now all the way back to like the middle ages bismarck really so the thing about it is though is ironically enough culture conf did not work very well right it didn't work well because the protestants and germans were like dude dude whoa bro we learned from the 30 years war and from the reformation period we don't care that much about what kind of church that they're into or whatever and also some of our kids go to catholic schools and stuff like that even though they're protestant because it's some of the best educations in the area so how about we not do that so actually people pushed against bismarck and thought that this was a terrible idea right and that's why literally it's considered one of his failed negative integration forms as you can see bismarck over here glaring at the pope and pope pius the ninth being like oh what's my next move gonna be and it basically was he left him unaffected right so that's a big thing that did end up happening that kind of blew up in his face and the germans actually kind of gravitated more towards Towards peace and understanding and things like that rather than this idea that he actually came up with in the culture comp but we'll talk about it a little bit more in some of its effects and stuff like that in class now the other big one were these anti-socialist laws now something that we need to understand about late 1800s Europe is most of these liberals during the time and most of these progressives and most of these conservatives are still in the holdover of like what you call it they're still in the holdover of the revolutions of 1848 which weren't that long ago when you really really think about it they all possibly were alive for this whole thing when the socialists began to make a lot of big demands, right? They started making demands of like certain hour labor, right? Certain minimum wages, certain health insurance benefits and stuff like that. And so what's going to end up happening is a lot of people are going to be like, man, we got to keep these socialists out of the Reichstag, right? Otto von Bismarck listens to those conservatives and liberals like, yeah, you guys are right. And so he literally creates a system of laws that makes it so you cannot wear socialist emblems inside the Reichstag. You cannot run on socialist platform parties, right? You can't have a name being a socialist you cannot do that because he's basically trying to eradicate the socialist movement in Germany and prevent them from being elected to the Reichstag well what those socialists are gonna do is they're just gonna move underground they're just gonna be like oh well we're not socialists anymore we're Democratic Republicans or we are have this new name we're gonna give ourselves a new name we're gonna call ourselves the labor party all right we're gonna call ourselves the workers party or something like that and instead of wearing the insignias what they're gonna do is they're gonna like weave red thread into their buttons and stuff like that on their shirts they're gonna be like sorry bro I like red a lot right I know it's a socialist color but I just like red and like so what are you gonna do about it turd and so another thing that they're gonna do is wear red flowers in their lapels and stuff like that so another thing happened is like you can't stomp out political perspective because they will actually rise up and I Ironically enough, after this, the biggest reaction by the public is a lot of them were like, Bismarck, man, like you're actually making them kind of stronger and stuff like that. Because like you're not only galvanizing the people that have already been voting for them, but you're also kind of pushing other people to vote for them as well, right? Which is bananas. So socialists started getting elected more to the Reichstag after this. And so Bismarck is just sitting over there like, man, I've been playing chess this whole time while everybody else is playing checkers. That's right. I said it again. Like So like now, so like I've been playing it this whole time. But the problem is, though, is dang it. It's kind of blowing up my face. My moves are a little crusty right now, right? I'm messing up. So he decides to convert 
It's a positive integration, right? He actually pivots then immediately, starts moving more in that direction, right? So he has peace mitigation talks with Pope Pius IX, and he actually allows the free movement and also not unrestricted completely, but freer movement of the Catholic Church to actually create educational standards to actually teach their own like, like kind of ideas in their schools, and then also kind of like creates a system of bishop appointment with Pope Pius IX in this newly formed German Empire, right? People applaud Bismarck for this, and they're like, very nice job, good sir, right? You see, this is the biggest thing about Bismarck is he's such a good politician because he's not stuck in his own ways, right? He's not going to sit there, do culture conf, and be like, no Catholics, and then just sit there and keep saying, no Catholics, and just like keep doing it all the time. He's going to react to what the people want and to what the people desire, right? So he goes into those peace mitigation talks. And also he says, all right, socialists, y'all want to... Uh play this game? Y'all want to play this game where like you like wear your little goofy flowers and your little threads or whatever? Fine. How about this? Using the classical liberals as my Trojan horse, I am going to pass insurance for all. Why would Bismarck do this, right? Because he's trying to show the people that are going to gravitate towards socialism that the classical liberals and that the liberal progressive Reichstag is okay with creating social welfare programs. Write this down. Bismarck starts creating the social welfare state in Germany to try and prevent the growth of the socialist parties. Because this is genius, right? It's genius. He's using the classical liberals as his Trojan horse by being like, look, these classical liberals are passing things that you would love. Like insurance for accident insurance. You get hurt on the job? We're going to pay you until you get healthy, right? You get old age, social security. Anybody ever heard of that before, right? Social security, socialism, right? Ideals of socialism being integrated into a progressive German economy, right? Old age insurance, you get too old to work anymore, big fella. We're going to give you a little bit of money. How about that? Like, so like, also another one, disability, right? You get hurt so drastically on the job, you can't work anymore. The German government will keep you afloat. Sound good, right? And then also healthcare, universal healthcare, for all people of German Empire citizenship, right? <clears throat> now, this is going to make the socialists happy and aggravated all at the same time because a lot of people are going to start voting for classical liberals that actually pass all this stuff, right? Again, Bismarck, he's playing chess again, right? He's back playing 4D chess. Now, the thing about it, though, is when he does all this stuff, it strengthens the German's economy, it strengthens the German Empire, and it makes them bigger, better, and even more ferocious. And it's also kind of freaking out the British a little bit. They're like, man, I remember the, the British Channel. They're like, really, remember the English Channel? They get really, really strong over there. But then probably the worst thing in the late 1800s happened. The worst possible thing in the late 1800s happened because it was all comes down to when this guy that we're about to talk about becomes the next Kaiser because Kaiser Wilhelm I dies, right? And his son is a smelly, stupid, dead, oh wait, oh wait, there you are, dead armed, Goofy mustache, look at this dumb thing that he has on his face, all right? So, goofy mustache, dead arm, brat, becomes the new Kaiser of, like, of Germany in 1888, right? So, Kaiser Wilhelm I dies, and Kaiser Wilhelm II is going to inherit the throne, right? Which means that Bismarck now has another Kaiser he has to work with. Now, the interesting thing about Kaiser Wilhelm II is he's awful. Like, so, like, he is, like, one of the worst people ever. Now, ironically enough, he's not, like, he just has a really, really weird personality, right? He's very, very narcissistic. He's very, very, like, constantly struggling with this version of toxic masculinity, right? And he also has a lot of toxic masculinity because he literally has a withered arm that hangs from his left shoulder. Like, this arm right here doesn't do anything, and he can barely move it and stuff like that, and it doesn't really feel any pain. And it's also six inches shorter than his left or his right arm and stuff like that. And so in all all of his pictures and stuff, he would actually have it propped up on top of a sword so it looked like it actually had mobility when it really, really didn't, right? And so he struggled with that because Prussians pride themselves on military strength and being able to ride a horse, shoot a gun, do all these different things, and he couldn't do it. And so literally, it affected his personality. And so when he takes the throne, he starts actually fighting against Bismarck. He starts going against it, being like, you puppeteered my father, but I won't let it happen to me. So he lifts all the anti-socialist legislation that Bismarck passed to try and earn like some like, like, so to try and earn some like liking from some of the other German people. And then he forced Bismarck to retire. So Bismarck actually was forced to resign in 1890 by this idiot because Bismarck actually is the guy that I believe had stayed in power, probably would have been able to prevent World War I. But no, Kaiser Wilhelm II's got to come along. He's got to ruin everything for everybody. All right. So like, now look, but we'll talk more about that guy in class. 
We talk about why I don't like him. We talk about why he's almost a direct cause of World War I. But just so you know where we are leaving off in Germany right now, Kaiser Wilhelm II is in charge. He has now forced Otto von Bismarck to like resign, who is doing the right thing by reacting to his bad decisions of negative integration and going with those positive ones, right? Well, let's move over to France, right? What's going on in France a little bit, right? So we talked about Germany. Now we're going to talk about France. Then we're going to talk about Britain if we have time, right? If we have a little bit of time left at the end of this, we will talk about Britain. But what's going on with France? When's the last time we checked in on France? Uh, last chapter, last thing we knew about France, is that they lost drastically in that Franco-Prussian War, right? They lost there in the Franco-Prussian War, which broke out in 1870, or like broke out in 1869, 1870, right? Going into 1871. Well, actually, it broke out in 1871. It was a very short war. So like, yeah, the thing about it is the Franco-Prussian War breaks out in 1871, okay? And, like, what ends up going down is Napoleon III gets captured at the Battle of Sedan. Remember, that was that picture of Otto von Bismarck sitting on the bench talking to Napoleon III. And when this occurs, right, like, so we know that the French people are like, uh, 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 we're not an empire anymore. We're a republic again. And they get rid of, like, Napoleon III as their emperor, and they become the French Third Republic, right? Now, the thing about it was, then, as we also know, they started eating zoo animals and stuff like that because the Prussians are going to move in, okay, they were the, or the North German Confederation Army, Bismarck. Mark's army moved in and encircled Paris and bombarded the city to try and force them into starvation and surrendering without having to directly actually kill women and children and stuff like that, okay? So the thing about it, though, is what's going to end up happening in that city, in the city of Paris at this time, when the actual Germans have encircled the city and they are actually starving them out and they're all eating zoo animals and dogs and cats and rats and stuff like that to try and stay alive, this period of time was known as the Paris Commune. Right now, notice really quickly though, commune in red sounds a lot like what communism because literally it was right. Like, so the Paris Commune was a rejection of governmental values on the way that they had existed before, right? It was the French Third Republic, and the French Third Republic was based in a communist style revolution, one in which that there was only a governing state body to regulate the distribution of goods and the distribution of money and land and wealth to make sure that all parties were necessarily even, okay? The thing about it, though, is, is the Paris Commune, which was ultimately violent and destroyed many landmarks inside of Paris to try and reject the old government. They created more barricades and used cannons to try and repel the Prussians and things like that. And they, of course, had their vive la commune, right? Like, so actually trying to like go to the very first attempt at a communist revolution actually happened in France. And it failed. It failed pretty miserably, right? It only lasted a few weeks and stuff like that. And 20,000 people died in the destruction of the commune, right? When the Prussians moved in and when the soldiers began to try and resist the actual Germans moving in and stuff like that, <clears throat> 20,000 people died defending this communist revolution, okay? That period of time is also known as the bloody week. All right, so like now, but the thing about it that we just need to know or remember about the Paris Commune is that legit, it was the very first attempted communist revolution, right? Which is why when we read that communist manifesto, is that a lot of this is gonna start making more sense. All right, so like now look, but the third republic in power, uh, or the third republic is going to come into power after the destruction of the commune in 1871, okay? So the bloody week destroys the Paris commune, the Third Republic is now in charge, okay? So the Third Republic is going to be led by a new president, okay? The president that will be elected after the destruction of Napoleon III's power is a guy by the name of Adolf Thiers, right? Now, Adolf Thiers is kind of a weird dude in history because, like, he does a lot of great things, does a lot of terrible things, right? But the biggest thing about it is he's a lot like Otto von Bismarck. And he's a lot more along the ideas of being like, we need to create a governmental system that actually provides stability to prevent this communistic revolution to prevent revolutions of 1848 to try and do the most while accomplishing the most as well. We need a utilitarian Jeremy Bentham style government that the British have been doing this whole time, okay? So Adolf Thiers comes in as president and he wants to completely avoid relenting to another monarch. He wants to know another monarch. He doesn't want another like president that will grow into an emperor like Napoleon III did. And he said, we need to create a government that divides us the least, right? And so he does this by actually, when he recreates the Chamber of Deputies, when he recreates the legislative body, he creates a progressive Republican style government. And in this, he brings social welfare programs to France as well in the late 1800s. He legalizes trade unions, right? He creates free and compulsory education for both sexes. 
Women are getting a win and they're getting schools opened up for them in France. It's about friggin' time, right? Now, ironically enough, Adolf Thiers did not come up with this concept of like big like like schools created for all and stuff like that. That actually was a Napoleonic reform. Napoleon, the first, the first Napoleon created these things called lyces and stuff like that, as y'all probably remember. He's the one that came up with the idea of creating more schools. But Adolf Thiers went a little socialist with it to try and keep those people that had just died in the Paris Commune a little bit more happy and said these will be free government funded, and we will try to make it so all of our citizens can read, write, and have the basic three R skills, which is reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? The only people that did not like the idea that taxes are going up to create public schools, that taxes are going up to help legalize trade unions and fight for better working standards. And the other thing about it is the only people that didn't like the social welfare programs that were on the rise in France to try and keep the socialists happy, to keep the liberals happy, the only people that don't like it, of course, are French conservative Catholics, right? So now look, the big thing about it though is, to give you a heads up, their Catholicism, surprisingly enough, in this particular moment, does not matter as much as you might think it does. All right, so like now, like so, their Catho their Catholicism kind of actually pops up here in the next segment, okay? And we're going to talk about something a lot in class, and we're going to kind of cut this flip off here in about two seconds. The fracturing, though, emerged most drastically. Like, so like, during a very important event known as the Dreyfus Affair, Okay. So basically when Adolf, Adolf Thiers comes in, he creates these social welfare programs, creates these new schools, creates these new ideas of creating taxes for social welfare programs and things like that. He may actually even model himself later on off of the German idea and create more like health insurance and stuff like that as well. The Germans did it right. I'm just saying they did a really good job at it. But like now the thing about it when we're looking at it though is the French conservative Catholics that were being elected into the Chamber of Deputies, they were called the French Catholic Center Party. Um... Their aggression, like, really started to show during this thing known as the Dreyfus Affair. And it kind of really formally split these two parties that actually were there in, like, France into the French Catholic Center Party, the conservative one over on the right, and then there was this other one over on the left known as the National Liberal Party, okay? Like, so, but what we're going to see and talk about in class is the Dreyfus Affair and why this event caused them to sever from each other so much and how it's going to actually demonstrate something that's under the surface in all these European countries. And it's this thing known as anti-Semitism, okay? Anti-Semitism is the industrialized hatred and also violent action towards people of the Jewish race. So we'll talk more about that in class, okay? It's a big, big story that we'll discuss, okay? I'm very excited to talk about it with y'all because it's a very good story. And um, last year we like really, really talked about it a lot and kids really enjoyed it. And Alfred Dreyfus is just like a really cool character, all right? So we'll talk about the Dreyfus Affair and we'll talk about how France, did all these positive things now this event will kind of sever their government going forward all right we'll talk about that soon y'all go